In 1929, something happened just down the street from where George Washington was sworn in as this country's first president. The street was Wall Street, where on October 29th, the booming American stock market suddenly crashed. It would impact the lives of every American. Trouble hit me hard that last day in October. They told me I needed more cash. I couldn't get it. I was wiped out that day. The crash led to the worst economic crisis in American history as banks failed and factories closed down. It became known as the Great Depression, and by 1931, 12 million Americans were out of work. And then a massive drought in the West began turning the country's farmland into dust, spreading more suffering and poverty across America. What made the situation even worse was the fact that suffering Americans were getting little sympathy from the White House. Herbert Hoover, who believed in limited government, refused to intervene in the crisis. I do not believe that the power and duty of the general government ought to be extended to the relief of individual suffering. In 1932, Hoover stated publicly that no one in America was actually starving. But he was wrong. Almost a million Americans were living in cardboard shacks in shanty towns across the country as the writer John Dos Passos described. They sleep in little lean-tos built out of old newspapers, cardboard boxes, bits of tin, or tar paper roofing, every kind of cockeyed makeshift shelter from the rain scraped together out of the city dump. People called them Hoovervilles, blaming the president, who didn't seem to grasp the severity of the crisis. I am convinced we have passed the worst, and with continued effort, we shall rapidly recover. In the summer of 1932, thousands of World War I veterans and their families marched to Washington and camped in protest outside the Capitol. Congress had voted them a cash bonus for their war service, but the bonus was not due until 1945. They needed it now. They called themselves the Bonus Army, and they marched through the streets in peaceful protest. But instead of responding sympathetically, an unnerved Herbert Hoover asked the army to intervene. In the grips of the Great Depression, the government turned against its own citizens. It's war, the greatest concentration of fighting troops in Washington since 1865, to rout the bonus army from government property, which they have been occupying without permission. The police cannot handle them. And so they're being forced out of their shacks by smoke bombs and tear gas hurled by the troops. The soldiers have orders to burn down the unsanitary and illegal camp. By the time it was over, dozens of war veterans had been wounded, and two babies had died from tear gas. Americans everywhere felt they were getting a raw deal. 
I say to you now that from this date on, I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. To a nation suffering from three years of poverty and unemployment, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal sounded good. The election of 1932 was a landslide. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. This nation is asking for action and action now. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power. In the first hundred days of his presidency, Roosevelt wielded executive power like no other president in history. He regulated the stock market, made bank deposits safe, required employers to pay fair wages, brought assistance to farmers, and helped put millions of Americans back to work. We are moving forward to greater freedom, to greater security for the average man than he has ever known before in the history of America. President Roosevelt very consciously tried to use the words liberty and freedom to associate them with the New Deal. Roosevelt very explicitly said, we have had an out-of-date idea of liberty. Liberty has meant this idea of everybody pursuing their own interests regardless of the public good. Now we have to think of liberty as meaning economic security for the ordinary man and woman, and the government has to provide that. So liberty meant having things like the Social Security Act, minimum wage laws, the right to form unions guaranteed by the government. These were key elements of the New Deal, and they were meant to create the social conditions of freedom. What many in the public didn't know about Franklin Roosevelt was that he was paralyzed from the waist down and confined to a wheelchair. So Eleanor Roosevelt, FDR's idealistic and energetic first lady, became his link to the people. While he stayed in the White House, she went to coal mines and factories and workers' meetings. Then she told the president what people were thinking. Franklin often used me to get the reflection of other people's thinking because he knew I made it a point to see and talk with a wide variety of people. Franklin and Eleanor became a team one of the greatest political partnerships in history. If the Depression in America gave rise to Franklin Roosevelt, the same depression happening in Germany led to a very different sort of leader. On the very day of Franklin Roosevelt's inauguration in 1933, the Reichstag, Germany's Congress, was deciding to give over total control to its chancellor, Adolf Hitler. Hitler called his movement Nazism for National Socialism. In fact, it was a dictatorship out to destroy freedom. In other countries like Spain and Italy, similar political leaders took control. They were called fascists, and fascism became a 20th century disease. Another disease that was spreading in the world was anti-Semitism. It was hatred of Jews. The Nazis would perform gruesome medical experiments on innocent human beings. They would build factories of death. And they would hunt down the Jews of Europe, as well as others that they hated, and send them to concentration camps to be killed. In 1938, Adolf Hitler conquered Austria and then Czechoslovakia, and the European democracies let him do it. When the Nazis marched into Poland in 1939, Britain and France declared war on Germany. By June 1940, Holland, Belgium, Norway, and France had all fallen to Hitler's Germany, and triumphant Nazi soldiers were parading through Paris. Winston Churchill was now Britain's new prime minister. I speak to you for the first time as prime minister 
in a solemn hour for the life of our country, of our allies, and above all, of the cause of freedom. At first, the United States maintained neutrality. Our national policy is not directed toward war. Its sole purpose is to keep war away from our country and away from our people. Then on June 22, 1941, Germany invaded the Soviet Union. As the Soviets, led by Joseph Stalin, joined with the Allied forces against Hitler, Franklin Roosevelt told the American people they must be willing to defend freedom against forces which would enslave the world. It was sunny on December 7, 1941, and at the White House, Eleanor Roosevelt was preparing for a formal lunch with her husband and 30 guests. At the last minute, the president sent word that he could not attend. He had just received a message from Hawaii which said, air raid on Pearl Harbor, this is not a drill. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. At 7.55 that Sunday morning, Japanese planes had let bombs loose on Pearl Harbor's battleship row, where U.S. warships were lined up, making a hard-to-miss target. By the time the planes left, much of the Pacific fleet had been crippled or sunk. More than 2,000 people were dead. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Just one day after the attack, in response to President Roosevelt's request, Congress declared war on Japan. Three days later, Japan's allies, Germany and Italy, declared war on the United States. America found itself at war in two parts of the world, the Eastern Front and the Western, Atlantic and Pacific. The first battles were grim. American soldiers took a terrible pounding in the Pacific. It was scorching hot and corpses were piled everywhere. At nightfall, we were attacked. One shell landed so close to me that I was thrown to the ground. When I sat up, I had to pull pieces of coral gravel out of my face. But then the Allies won three big victories in the Coral Sea, at Midway Island, and at Guadalcanal and President Roosevelt rallied the country in the name of freedom. This nation has placed its destiny in the hands and heads and hearts of its millions of free men and women. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. President Roosevelt identified American war aims as bringing four freedoms to the entire world. The four freedoms were freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. Then it was in this language of freedom that the war was fought, and these very popular images of the four freedoms were used to galvanize support for American participation. But at the same time Americans were rallying behind the cause of freedom, they were trampling on the freedom of Japanese Americans. President Roosevelt was worried about national security, so he issued Executive Order 9102 that targeted Americans of Japanese descent. Without any notice, without due process, and with only a few days to get ready, Japanese Americans in California and other Western states were arrested and sent to internment camps. Haruko Obata was from San Francisco. When we arrived at Tanfaran, it was raining. It was so sad and depressing. The roadway was all mud, and our shoes would get stuck in the mud when we walked outside. They gave us a horse stable. That was our sleeping quarters. Harold Ickes was Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of the Interior. I saw the United States Army give way to mass hysteria over the Japanese. Crowded into cars like cattle, these hapless people were hurried away to hastily constructed camps. 
We gave the fancy name of relocation centers to them, but what they were were concentration camps. Though their voices are silent, their pleading looks will say, Oh, hard times come again no more. In 1943, after the Soviet Union won the Battle of Stalingrad against the Nazis, Britain's Prime Minister Winston Churchill said, we have reached the end of the beginning. For four years, the Allies had held on in this terrible war to preserve freedom in the world. London itself had been bombed into rubble, but Churchill had helped keep his country's spirit alive. Lift up your heart. All will come right, out of the depths of sorrow and of sacrifice, will be born again the glory of mankind. Now, in 1943, under the command of U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Allies began to win. May the light of freedom, coming to all darkened lands, flame brightly, until at last the darkness is no more. Plans began for Operation Overlord, code name for the invasion and recapture of France. The Germans had lined the beaches of Normandy with mines and steel barriers. On high cliffs overlooking possible landing areas, they had erected heavy guns. Despite the Nazi wall, Eisenhower decided to launch a major attack. June 6, 1944, would forever be known as D-Day. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well trained. He will fight savagely. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck. And let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. At daybreak, the sky filled with airplanes, 9,000 of them. The largest naval fleet ever assembled for war appeared off the French coast. Slowly at first, but then steadily, soldiers began to land and head onto the beach, into the fierce guns on top of the bluffs. The first to land were shot down at the water's edge. 5,000 would die before reinforcement arrived. But by day's end, Allied troops were holding French soil. They had broken the Nazi wall. They were on their way to Berlin. One year later, after fierce battles inside France and Germany, General Eisenhower announced that the war in Europe was finally over. The Allied force, which invaded Europe on June 6, 1944, has utterly defeated the Germans by land, sea, and air. President Roosevelt did not live to see the end of the war. In the spring of 1945, he was in Warm Springs, Georgia. He was exhausted and needed a few days rest. He was writing a letter and thinking about the peace that was to come. Then Roosevelt raised a hand to his temple and said, I have a terrific headache. They were the last words he would ever speak. FDR died of a hemorrhage in his brain. His flag-draped coffin was put aboard a funeral train for the journey back to Washington. Eleanor Roosevelt gazed out the train window. 
I lay in my berth, watching the faces of the people at stations, and even at crossroads, who had come to pay their last tribute through the night. The whole nation paid tribute to a man who had been their president for 13 years and who had led America through both depression and world war. Although the war in Europe was over, the war in the Pacific against Japan raged on. The new president, Harry Truman, looked on in horror as more than 12,000 American troops were killed at Okinawa. Pentagon officials estimated that the planned invasion of Japan would cost at least another 55,000 American lives. And so Truman decided to make use of a powerful new weapon that scientists had been developing secretly in New Mexico, an atomic bomb. First, along with the leaders of China and Great Britain, he issued a call to Japan for unconditional surrender. It read, we are poised to strike the final blows upon Japan and warned of the utter devastation of the Japanese homeland. But the call for surrender was ignored by the Japanese who vowed to continue fighting to the end. At 8.15 a.m. on August 6, 1945, an atom bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. 75,000 Japanese were killed instantly. The entire city was leveled. And yet still, there was no surrender. Truman then issued another warning. Let there be no mistake. We shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. Well, I wish I could be long 